This week on CrossFeed. The War on Newborns. Santorum's War on Pornography. Indiana's War on Religious Daycare. NASA's War on Intelligent Design. The Church of England's War on Evangelicals. Hello, everybody, and welcome to CrossFeed Religious News. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, pastor of Shepherd of the Ridge Lutheran Church in North Ridgeville, Ohio. Hey, I'm Dr. Jim Butler, pastor of St. Luke's Lutheran Church out in beautiful Dedham, Massachusetts, just off the uh, just on the edge of Boston. And it's good to be with you guys again this week. Uh, <coughs> hope you all are um, had a good week in the awesome weather we've been having lately. Um, you know, we're heading up. We're going to be in 80 degrees this week. We I can't. You guys are at 80 degrees this mm-hmm. week. Are. Yeah, yeah, we already hit it. Man, it's crazy. Yeah. So I no. expect. Uh, yeah, tulips are coming up and everything in March. It's incredible. So, uh, although maple syrup was just dead up here this year. Oh yeah. Never got cold enough. I suppose my my big concern is that we had such a mild winter that um we're gonna have insect infestations like crazy. We're gonna have that. Yep. So we 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 will pay for it. Mm-hmm. But that's okay, folks. Don't worry. Winter will be back again next, you know, next December, and we'll, you know, see how, you know, I'm sure we'll be back to 100 inches of snow then. Um, but uh, okay, lots of interesting stories this week, mm-hmm. um, and uh, some of them that are very, I think, uh, difficult and 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 and, and uh, powerful and uh, just just. Uh, Interesting, but let's begin with one that I think it, I thought was maybe a little hopeful, actually, and uh, that was the rise of evangelicalism in the, the Anglican Church, the Church of mm-hmm. England. Yeah. Um, now, uh, you know, I believe, um, and this is gonna, the, the, this this is gonna make would make some Lutherans really uneasy, okay? But I believe there are always renewal movements going on in the church. Uh, somebody once said the church is always in need of reformation. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, 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 you know, the church always needs to be reformed. And I believe God is always sending re- reforming movements through the church. Um, you know, uh, we had Luther reforming the church, uh, and then, um, even Lutheran doctrine became this dead orthodoxy, the orthodoxist period, they call it, or the period of orthodoxy. And then it was infused with, with pietism where people said, you know what? It's not enough to be just a member of the state church and go to, go to church. We need to have this relationship. And yeah, there were issues with pietism, but it was overall a, a, a reforming movement. Um, and that was in England. I mean, and that was in Germany. And England's version of that, of course, was the Wesley brothers and, and Methodism. Uh, which again was just reforming movement, trying to bring a, a, an area of, of, of growth and stuff. Uh, in the 1950s in America, we had the rise of evangelicalism, and also a little bit then in the Church of England. Uh, and now in the Church of England, there is again a growing evangelicalism. Um, and uh, you know, unfortunately, we've lost some of the great. Uh, I mean, I don't know if people realize, uh, InterVarsity Christian Fellowship was originally a British movement. Um, and of course, uh, the great evangelical scholar, um, several of them, uh, John R. W. Stott, uh, F. F. Bruce, you know, all were English. But it could look like it was dying out there for a while. And, but now there is a rebirth of evangelicalism going on in the Church of England. And this is from The Economist. Yeah. Now, the interesting thing is there, um, the church, Worship attendance is continuing to fall, right? Um, uh, we have uh, some statistics here. Forty percent of all Anglicans attend evangelical parishes these days, up from twenty-six percent in nineteen eighty-nine. So, against the background of overall decline, this number of regular worshippers in the Church of England will have fallen to six hundred and eighty thousand by twenty twenty. Uh, right now, it's eight hundred thousand, and um, just under. A million a decade ago. All right, so you know that's uh, that's a it, they're down by quite a bit uh, overall. But um, but he says the lukewarm are falling away, leaving the pews to the more fervent. Um, that people are coming back, but so you know those who are just really 
disconnected, um, that were just going for tradition or something, um, are, are drifting away. But at the same time, there's a, there's a resurgence of people that are really looking to, um, to, to connect and, um, and are seeing the church as more than just a social club. Uh, and, and, and there's a variety of movements. It's just the same way with American evangelicalism. There's a variety of movements and traditions, um, uh, you know. That's it, the, but yet are kind of glossing over traditional theological issues. It's it's, it's kind of a, a kind of amazing. I mean, I went to Gordon Conwell, which is an evangelical seminary, and we had Methodists, we had Presbyterians, uh, both like OPC, uh, Orthodox Presbyterian Church, and um, mainline uh, Presbyterians. Uh, and we have a uh, um, guy who was Episcopalian. We had a couple of Church of England people. So we had a, a wide variety, um, but yet all broadly identified as evangelical. Uh, we, we actually had an ELCA Lutheran uh, going there because uh, he was afraid of going to an ELCA seminary, what that would be like. Um, so uh, George and Dave from you know our ELCA brothers, like, it's true, sorry. Uh, anyway... Um, um, but there are also then the, the, these different strands. So um, Holy Trinity uh, is uh, charismatic, and it has had – that's the church that's had this huge impact uh, on the church via the Alpha Course. And so you can find you know, all the stuff of you know, Alpha Courses even being used in America, uh, even in Lutheran churches. I don't know who used the Alpha Course. Yeah. Uh, the, I mean there's definitely can some – um, concerns about the Alpha Course. I haven't used it, and um, you know, disclaimer: I haven't sat down and really looked through it. Um, I've I've only read about it, so um, I mean, you know, th- that needs to be noted. Um, but from what I've read about it, uh, if the, what I've read is accurate, you know, there's some concerns. Right. Oh, there's, yeah, definitely some concern there. Uh, but that that's them. Uh, then there's uh, All Souls in Langham Place. Which is uh, <laughs> like this radiates forth a more sober brand of evangelicalism. Uh, I love that. Now I think All Souls is uh, John R. W. Stott's church, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but it's a more, not only more sober, sober, probably a little bit more educated. Um, you know, uh, I recently got to hear one of the people from that parish, if that's the right one, Rico Tice. Uh, and he's got a wonderful introduction to, uh, to Christianity. He walks people through the Gospel of Man, uh, the Gospel of Mark. That's how he, uh, and that's their new members class. That's their con- adult confirmation as they walk you through the Gospel of Mark. That's kind of cool. And uh, hit up hit up all the doctrine you need uh, and, and all the issues of doctrine in the go- as you go through the Gospel of Mark. Uh, it's really kind of a, a cool thing that he's got. Uh, I can't remember the name of the class right now, but um, but I have a. a an MP3 of him speaking in uh, Ohio, uh, hmm. and he's really quite good. Uh, That's interesting. I, I tend not to recommend the Gospel of Mark to um, new Christians just because it's so weird. <laughs> I tend to recommend John instead, but um, oh, that, that's cool. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, you know, this is really encouraging because um, this is something that we've talked about this before, that when you have a state church, uh because the state influences the the teachings of the church and and that the church very quickly becomes irrelevant um in people's lives um but you know you've got this resurgence there um if if you could just go through and look at um at various podcasts out there uh i found a lot of stuff coming out of england there was one that i subscribed to for a while it has some really great interviews and and stuff uh it's called slip uh, slipstream um, you look for Slipstream podcast in the iTunes directory. Uh, that's coming out of England, and it's a uh, um, it's basically coming out of an evangelical movement um, that is you know they're looking to re-energize the church and teach church leadership and that and um, so you know it, it, this stuff is all really exciting. Just um, seeing that that the people that the gospel is not dead there. No, yeah. it is not. Uh, said uh, perhaps a third of uh, newly ordained pastors in the Church of England are evangelical. But again, you know, what, who has this this heart for the gospel? Who wants to become? You know, I mean, um, 
you know, that a lot of them who really want to do this are, are going to be the evangelical guys who can really put themselves out there. Um, uh, and really understand what it's all about. Uh, uh, and it's not just about getting a really nice parish that's going to pay you well so you can live well and retire well. Yeah. Yeah, um, they want to get the gospel out and, you know, change lives and connect people with Jesus. I, I think it's great. And, um, you know, okay, and, and so we should probably note that um, as Lutherans, uh, Lutherans are not generally categorized as evangelicals, even though we were the first ones to actually uh, have that name applied to us. Um, but uh, we tend to be uh, more mainstream uh, as far as categories go. And um, yet the mainstream churches in, um, well, in Europe in general, but uh, more and more in America too, um, tend to be uh, tend to be very liberal in doctrine and uh, sort of pick apart the Bible and, and stuff like that. And it's not, again, this is a, a, a trend, a tendency, not that there's certainly exceptions. Luther Church, Missouri Synod is one of them. Um, and uh, so, and, and there's definitely exceptions within those of individual pastors and congregations within those um, denominations too. Um, you know, because the other thing that, that England is dealing with is, um, well, they, they've got their, uh, Rowan Williams, the uh, Archbishop of Canterbury, um, is he's a moderate and he's against gay marriage and things like that. And so, you know, he's been butting heads with, with people. Um, and, but he probably uh, will be wind up allowing women bishops. But, you know, I, I mean, evangelicalism is, is kind of hard to really in even America to define because you can find it within um, what would be considered more liberal church bodies. You know, they're, they're the evangelical groups. People graduate Gordon-Conwell, Trinity Divinity School, um, Fuller Seminary out in California. And uh, so they, 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 there are these more, you know, the, the people graduate there and they're, they're more conservative evangelical. They, we in the LCMS actually ha would really line into, I think, be grouped in with American evangelicalism overall. If you kind of look from liberal to conservative in America, we are probably there. I mean, we have a lot of alliances there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, our people work uh, with um, on the um, Association of Confessing Evangelicals. We're off. Uh, a lot of our guys are in the White Horse Inn. Um, we, you know, we our professors are asked to speak at uh, a lot of uh, evangelical conferences. So we, we, the broad American evangelical movement, we've got a lot of ties with. Even right. Well, you know, we hold the Bible in high regard, and, and you know, we consider it the Word of God, and um, you know, just that right there. Um, sort of aligns us more with the evangelical movement um, than a lot of mainstream churches. So, um, yep. but it, so no, this is, uh, this is great news. It, it just, it absolutely is. Um, you know, I, I, so often, you know, we've, we've been talking a lot about uh, religious freedom lately um, and sort of religious freedom in the extreme is, is when you have um, a, a state sponsored church, but what it actually ends up doing is reducing religious freedom because then the state starts to tell the church what to do. Um, and, and you end up, it ends up being so watered down. And so, um, you know, I've always said that, that what the church needs more than anything is persecution. And, um, <laughs> not that I want to invite it because, uh, you know, I, uh, I enjoy my freedom. Um, but at the same time, that's where the church thrives. And so to see um, in a, a country where the church is not persecuted, um, certainly disagreed with by um, the government that it's supposed to be connected with, uh, oftentimes, um, it's, it's good to see these sort of things happening without the necessity of persecution. Right. Well, it becomes, yeah, otherwise it becomes part of the state and a handmaiden of the state. Mm -hmm. um, well, while we're talking with people with British accents, let's go over to Australia here. All right. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Some bad okay. news. Wow. Yeah. Now this is just a a a a a uh, 
a month ago in the journal, um, the Journal of Medical Ethics to um, Australian ethicists. And their names are, let me get these right, um, Dr. Francisca Minerva, the University of Melbourne, and um, Alberto Ghirlubini. And I'm not sure, he teaches also in Australia. He's also a medical ethicist in Australia. And uh, basically, they have followed the, the, the logic that we've always said was coming. Mm-hmm. I mean, people are, a lot of people are up in arms about this, this article, and I can't understand why, because they, they really are following the logic of the pro choice movement to its logical conclusion. Okay. And so what they're is, talking, what they're talking there about There is no is- difference between a fetus and a newborn. Mm-hmm. Um, so, um, here, 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 here's the abstract to the paper. By showing that one, both fetuses and newborns do not have the same moral status as actual persons. Two, the fact that both are potential persons is morally irrelevant. And three, adoption is not always in the best interest of actual people. The authors argue that what we call after birth abortion, killing a newborn, should be permissible in all cases where abortion is, including cases where the newborn is not disabled. Mm-hmm. All right. And, and yeah, and here's the thing. It's completely consistent. It's absolutely consistent. <laughs> <laughs> right. Just- so when I, first, when I first started reading this article, all right, I saw afterbirth abortion, all right, and I thought about what has been pushed for, uh, for instance, by uh, President Obama before he was president, um, and that is uh, the that when you have a botched abortion where the baby comes out alive instead of dead, that they would take that baby and stick him in a closet and let him die, because that was the plan to begin with. All right. So I thought that's what they were talking about, but this is actually talking about the woman takes the baby to term. The baby's born, and after the baby is born, she says, ah, I've had second thoughts. Uh, you know, my boyfriend's a jerk. Um, he's, he's not around my anymore. Left me. My husband left me. Um, you know, or... We, we just financially is not going to be able to afford another mouth to feed in the house. Yeah, or whatever, okay? You know, pick your excuse. It doesn't have to be a good one. Any reason that you could have an abortion prior to birth, you should allow to have a, quote, afterbirth abortion. Yeah. Or what would... Until the child... Until the... the this, this, <laughs> it's amazing. To, you got to read the actual article. I mean, yeah, it's, but know, like, um, not but, after you've just eaten. No, okay. that no. I don't know if you read the. Did you read, just read the, the the summary article that I sent you? Did you read the actual article? No, because it said that the actual article was um, taken down. No, it's it's still on. It's still oh. there. You but you just have to Google it. It's after birth abortion. Why colon? Why should the baby live? That's the name of the article. If you Google that, you will be taken to the actual article on the Journal of Medical Ethics. But if you just go to the Journal of Medical Ethics website, you, it's, you can't find it. It's buried. It's, they took down the link. But if you Google it, you, you, it pops up. And um, I mean, <laughs> you know, in such cases, we need to assess the facts in order to decide whether the same arguments that apply to killing a human fetus. Notice this, by the way. They even say killing. Killing a human fetus can also be consistently applied to killing a newborn human. This almost sounds like Jonathan Swift. Well, that's what they compare it to, yeah. Yeah, the, the guy and, and, and the Weekly Standard. I mean, but they're dead serious. Yeah, you keep waiting for the punchline, and it never yes. comes. Um, um, you know, the, and, the, the, and that's the thing. There's been, um, oh, what's it, um, Machiavelli. I mean, it, um, his writing was intended to be satire. And um, but now he's considered horribly evil because the stuff was taken seriously. We even have the term Machiavellian. All right, mm-hmm. um, these guys intend to be taken seriously. All right, so you know they're saying that well, um, you know the the baby 
doesn't... Oh, where was that? Um... Oh, do you do? David knows babies and the soft spots on their heads. Do 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 do. They they have to kill the infant before he develops those properties that justify the attribution of a right to life to an individual. Um. And what was it? Because it talked about the um. Basically, once the once the kid is old enough to figure out that he doesn't want to die. Then you can't do it anymore. Right. Okay. Yeah. Both a fetus and a newborn certainly are human beings. This is, this is the actual article. Okay. That's certainly are human beings. Yeah. And potential persons. But neither is a person in the sense of subject of a moral right to life. We take person to mean an individual who is capable of attributing to her own existence some at least basic value, such as being deprived of this existence, represents a loss to her. This means that many non-human animals and mentally retarded human individuals are persons. But not all the individuals who are not in any condition of attributing a value to their own existence are not persons. Mm -hmm. Think about it. Non-human animals are persons. Yes, but but humans are not. Right, but an, 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 a newborn infant is not a person. So so and you're. By the way, <laughs> here, here, go ahead. So 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 it's the person if they can say so long and thanks for all the fish. <laughs> so here's the question: What about a person, and an older adult who has dementia? Right, and they is this be. person? You know, um, does this person, is this person capable of attributing to her own existence some at least basic value such that being deprived of this existence represents a loss? Yeah, and for some people it's not, so therefore you can call the herd. I, you know, I mean, is, is, is that, um, think about this for a second. Um, you know, I mean, that's, that's what you're saying. Um, if, um, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, I mean, this is, this, this is, um, and, and uh, the issue of after birth abortion is not about the kid. <laughs> Those kids are driving me crazy. Um, you know, uh, 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 um, sort of never, you know, then. you know, well, well, but, but, you know, it, the rights and interests of the actual people involved should represent the prevailing consideration and decision about abortion and afterbirth abortion. Uh? Right. Yeah, and they even go so far as to um, to shoot down adoption. Um, yes. Which uh, <laughs> Jim and I would both take umbrage to. Um, right. So, so it says. Um, some people. Oh, um, I gotta read this one. Yeah, let me interrupt you. I'm go sorry. Ahead, go ahead. And then we'll go back to adoption. I'm sorry for interrupting you. But actual people's, actual people, okay? The, now this is not the infant, this is the adults, older brothers and sisters, whoever. Actual people's well-being could be threatened by the new, even if healthy, child, requiring money, energy, and care, which the family might happen to be in short supply of. Sometimes this situation can be prevented through an abortion. But in some other cases, this is not possible. In these cases, since non-persons have no moral rights to life, there are no reasons for banning afterbirth abortions. Yeah. I just, 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 why don't we? Why don't we go completely Orwellian? Instead of saying non-person, call them unpersons. I don't know. I, I'm thinking that. Uh, um, <laughs> Let's just open a soil and green factory while we're at it. Yeah. Well, so. oh, by the way, yeah. And they don't want to use the term infanticide because, you know, hey, if you – this is this is an afterbirth abortion. It's, you know, because there's really no moral difference between pre-birth abortion and afterbirth abortion. This, okay. So go go with adoption. Just just share okay. their, their view of adoption. This is incredible. All right. Um, <clears throat> uh 
The authors ask the question, noting that some people, you and me for example, might think that adoption could buy enough time for the unwanted newborn to technically become a person and possibly increase the happiness of the people involved. But this is not a viable option, if you'll forgive the expression. A mother who kills her newborn baby, the authors report, is forced to accept the irreversibility of the loss. By contrast, a mother who gives her baby up for adoption might suffer psychological distress, and for a very simple reason. These mothers often dream that their child will return to them. This makes it difficult to accept the reality of the loss because they can never be quite sure whether or not it's irreversible. It's simpler for all concerned just to make sure the loss can't be reversed. <laughs> right. All right. So, you know, it's what we are suggesting that if interest of actual people should prevail, then after birth abortion should be considered a permissible option for women who would be damaged by giving up their newborns for adoption. Okay, so isn't one of the arguments against capital punishment that if it's decided later that it was um a, that it was not the the best thing that um the problem is it's irreversible? So now they're using that same argument in reverse. That the great thing about it is that it's irreversible. That you can't change your mind later. And the big irony here is that they're saying this now in a day and age when we have open adoptions and, and where, where the birth parents can, um, un, unless the child is taken away from them, um, like because they tried to kill them, um, that the, um, the parents can, the birth parents can basically choose how much involvement they would like if if they want it to be a completely closed adoption and and never have any contact again they can if they would like to have some level of connection um even to the point of being sort of a family friend that gets to watch the kid grow up and be involved in their lives on a um you know on a on sort of as like an aunt um that they can do that and, you know, and, and sort of everything in between, just, you know, they could say, well, I just, I want to be Facebook friends with the adoptive parents or, you know, or whatever they can, as, as birth parents, um, going through a private agency, they can pick and choose that kind of stuff. And, um, matter of fact, in your, your home study, they'll ask you, how open are you to an open adoption? Right. How open do you want it to be? So, you know, I mean, and that's, that's one of the beauties of adoption um, nowadays that was a problem, you know, 50 years ago, uh, less than that. But I mean, so, well, you know, this is, then she just has to come to terms. Guess what? Right. Women have abortions all the time and never come to terms with that reality that what they did is irreversible. Right. And guess what? Then there's nothing you can do about it because it is irreversible. This is this is insane. And then they get all kinds of hate mail for it, and they're surprised. <laughs> yeah. Um. Uh, 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 um. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> oh, by the way, how do we know when this child becomes a per that this 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 infant becomes a person? You know. Oh. From their perspective that's, or ours? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that, that's 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 the question you got to deal with. I mean, that's the question they've got to answer. You know, when when can't when is this now a a person, so that you cannot go with the afterbirth abortion? Oh, so, okay, so you know what they say? It depends on the neurological development of the newborn, which is something neurologists and psychologists would be able to assess. So, in other words, we don't want to get on that threshold. We don't know. We don't know when it becomes a person. I think they should just apply that, you know, um, in the movie Blade Runner, the the way you could tell the difference between a human and an android is to apply this empathy test. I think that they should just use that as their criteria. If you can pass the test and prove you're not an android, then... <laughs> Somewhere in here, too, by the way, they also say that, that, that people in favor of capital punishment are, are, are essentially arguing that... Um, um, murderers are not are not persons. 
And we would never make that argument. What we are arguing is that, you know, the, the, the death is so the, – their the, the crime is so heinous that – here it is. Yeah. Um, here, here's the argument. Merely being human is not in itself a reason for ascribing to someone a right to life. Indeed, many humans are not considered subjects of a right to life. Spare embryos where research on embryo stem cells are, is permitted. Fetuses where abortion is permitted. Criminals where capital punishment is legal. This is madness. I don't think you can. I, I think they're you're, you're, you're making us. What is this guy? Crazy? A, a sophist argument. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a pretty big leap. <clears throat> Man, um. I mean, you know, um. You know, because we would argue that yes, capital punishment people are indeed um, given a right to life. I mean, that's why you have to go through so many darn trials. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, okay. So anyway, on with their hate mail that they've gotten for this. Um. All right, now to, okay. So yeah, they they got a whole bunch of stuff, and, and here's their apology. We are really sorry that many people who do not share the background of the intended audience for this article felt offended, outraged, or even threatened. The article was supposed to be read by other fellow bioethicists who were already familiar with this topic and our arguments. It was a thought experiment, all right? Um, it's been going on for 40 years, all right? So, in other words, oh, well, see, you just don't understand the intricacies of the argument. Only a bioethicist could understand that. Well, guess what? Einstein said, I think it was Einstein, said, if you cannot explain what you're, what you believe in a simple way or, or what you're, if you cannot explain it in a simple way, then you don't really understand it. Um, she was interviewed by the, the Sydney Herald as well. Um, and she said, uh, this was a Francesca, Francesca Minerva. And she said, this was a theoretical and academic article. I didn't mean to change any laws. I'm really not in favor of infanticide. I'm just using logical arguments. Okay. So, you know, if if they're saying we're just trying to, uh, you know, sort of point out the internal consistency, um, you know, that basically this is intended as a satire, okay, fine. Then say that. But it's not a satire. They're dead serious. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm sure the uh, abortion law of the United States is not happy about this. Because it does show the, 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 the whole fallacy of their argument. It's the logical outcome, yeah. All right, so before we leave this subject, I think it's really important that we do talk about what we believe um, is, it constitutes personhood. Okay. And, and and why, all right? A person gets their value. First of all, um, when does someone become a person? Well, I think David said it best when he said, in sin did my mother conceive me, all right? We're sinners from the moment of conception, uh, which we have to define as fertilization because it's been redefined in the medical books as implantation, all right? We're sinners from the moment of conception. You can't be a sinner unless you're a person. Right, but we're also and and so then where do we get our value from? Because God provided a solution to that sinful condition by sending His Son Jesus to pay for our sins. All right, and so if you are someone that Jesus died for, you are a person. All right, and since Jesus even became an embryo, God became an embryo for us. He died for everyone for whom, um. That, that he became, all right? He became an embryo. He died for embryos. He became an, a child. He died for children. He became an adult. He died for adults. So, um, so, and so we define a person's value, not based on anything, um, intrinsic in them, except for the fact that they're created by God, right? But your, your ultimate value comes from the fact that you were bought with a price, the, the price of the blood of Christ, all right? That makes you of infinite value, all right? And as far as your um your value to society or something like that, all right, so often people's value is determined by what they can contribute, all right? And, and if you want to 
go down that path, I would contend that if, um, based on that, a person's value is not so much what they can give, but what they're capable of receiving. All right. Because the, where a person becomes truly value to us is in our opportunity to love them. Oh, very nice brain. When I have the chance to love someone who truly needs it, I gain so much more than what I could receive from them by their ability to um, manufacture an iPod. All right. So, uh, so the greater a person's um, need or disability, um, the greater value they are to society because they force us um, into love and compassion. Yep, did say thank you. I think you did that very eloquently. I couldn't say a word. Could not add a word to that. Uh, well, we're dealing with kids. Let's go to Indiana. Oh, and speaking of babies, the reason that uh, if, if anyone's annoyed by the beeping in the background, it's our baby monitor. It's not the connection. The network isn't strong enough or something like that. It keeps beeping, saying it's losing the signal. So apologies uh, okay. for that. I'm we understand your wife has to keep an eye on you, make sure you're being, you're, you're you know, healthy there. So that's okay. Um, anyway, this is, uh, I, I don't know. I, I'm, okay, so in Indiana, there are two levels of daycare. There, it's fully licensed, and there is, um, which is everybody but church related daycares. Um, Church Although some daycares, church-related daycares are fully licensed. They, some of them are, but they simply register their daycare and they avoid most state uh, oversight. Um, and now there's a one-year-old boy who died via drowning at a church daycare in Indianapolis. And so the, there's a question within the state then of whether or not all church-related daycares should be licensed. And several of the um, people in here <clears> – <throat> Um, are um, afraid. Uh, one woman at Crosstown Daycare um, at the Faith Based Center in Greenfield says, we follow a lot of rules already, so the question would be, how much more do they want? Um, oh, and just the numbers. There are 730 unlicensed faith-based daycare centers in Indiana and 601 licensed daycares. And only about 5% of church-related daycares are licensed. So the big concern is that um, if, if, you're, if the, you're licensed by the government, uh, some of them are even receiving uh, funding to help out with their school lunch programs uh, or, or their, their, I mean, their daycare lunch programs. Um, and, uh, and they're concerned that um, the more the government gets involved – the um the the government's going to step in and tell them what they can and can't teach, right? Um, you know, and, and also there's a stark difference. Licensed they, centers must follow 192 different rules. Unlicensed, 21. <laughs> so, uh, but the, most of them though, the the issue is, you know, can we? Would they still allow us to to have prayer, our chapel time, our you know Bible time, and stuff like that if we're a state licensed daycare? And and the answer right now is absolutely yes, but their concern is also that if if it becomes law that all daycares must be licensed, then um, you have then if they change the laws um, about what licensed daycares can and can't do or can and can't teach, um, then you're stuck. You know, it's it's one thing to say. Um, and and for I'll use our daycare uh, or our we don't have a daycare our preschool um, as an example. We're not in Indiana. We're in Ohio, um, but we uh, we are fully licensed. All right, it's it's very strict. It's a lot of extra work, um, and um, and and just all kinds of of crazy hoops that we have to jump through. I mean, just for instance, um, no one's allowed. We we had a um, a, a funeral. 
a while back, and it was going on while the, the, the preschool was going on downstairs, and we had the funeral upstairs. And, uh, and one of the people that was there to attend the funeral um, said, can I use your bathroom? And I had to say no. And he just kind of went, seriously? I said, yeah, because the way our licensing is, um, no adults are allowed in the bathrooms um, while preschool is in session. And, uh, and, and so because we don't currently have any other bathrooms in the building, um, I, I had to say no. And I mean, that's a pretty big problem that you have, um, something going on at church and no one's allowed to use the bathroom, but it is what it is. I find it odd that, you know, the, the, the rule is, gee, is no adults can be in the bathrooms with the kids because in our preschool, it's Teachers wind up taking the kids to the bathroom half the time, especially the three-year-olds. Well, yeah, I mean, I guess the the teachers can be in there, you know, but um, no other adults. Okay, see, we're on two levels, so the preschool downstairs and have their own bathrooms. Yeah, and and we, uh, if we had bathrooms upstairs, we would, and I'm hoping yeah. eventually we will. We just don't at this point. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, now Massachusetts, by the way. Is the strictest state – it was at one point, at least I know 10 years ago, was the strictest state in the country when it came to the rules for daycares. Okay, And um, even Massachusetts, you know, doesn't – you know, if you're a religious daycare, that's fine. You can you can even take the vouchers that the state offers for daycare. That's fine. You, you can preach all you want as long as you meet all the other requirements for daycares. And uh, – and that gets it does get a little irritating because, I mean, what, what what's okay to one licensor, the next licensor may, you know, want yeah. done. I mean, you know, you just you got to get to know the license, you know, and, and it seems like you know you just get to know the licensor what the licensor is looking for, and they change licensors on you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's you know the thing is, um, going through all the hoops that are necessary uh, to get licensed is, uh, I mean. It's a good thing because it's um, it ensures the safety of the kids. Right. Um, now, you know, there's always I some like concern. this one woman, um, uh, St. Mary's Child Center, Martin Luther King Jr. Street, um, 95 percent in poverty. Parents charge five bucks a week. So you get a lot of money from the state. And they went from being registered to licensed because we made a decision to be the best. And children should be – the people shouldn't be cheated on quality just because they're poor. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. You know, and I and I really – I mean, if it, you know, gives some sort of idea of the quality, as long as the state doesn't try to make, you know, rules on what you can teach. Mm -hmm. But that make sure that your curriculum is solid and stuff like that. Uh, it's good. Uh, you know, now I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know about I, I, what other states you know, require. Um, Massachusetts, you know, I mean, you actually have to be certified to be the lead teacher in an infant and toddler room. Oh yeah, there's there's definitely. I don't know exactly what they are, um, but there are rules about what the um, the the requirements for the teachers um, and and aides. Uh, as far as what their um, education level and and all that kind of stuff needs to be, yeah, there. Uh, I mean, it's it's a whole bunch of stuff. I mean, that you have yeah, to do. What are the problems? Is Massachusetts wants all teachers and all aides to have a four year degree? Now, most preschool and daycare lead teachers, it's a two year degree. It's associates, mm -hmm. um, and they want not only the, the teachers but the aides. It's really not real. realistic. It's not real. I don't know who's going to pay for these degrees because, right. you know, I, 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 the most I've ever seen a preschool aide get paid up here is $14 an hour. Oh, that's pretty good. What's you your know? minimum wage? Oh, we're above everybody else. I don't know what our minimum wage is. But, I mean, still, I mean, that's the most. Now, I see a lot of them getting paid 11 and $12 an hour. Well, wh where the heck are you going to go to school and spend twenty grand at least to go to a a, uni a four year university and come out and earn ten bucks an hour, eleven bucks an hour? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it just it just makes like, no sense. All of our um, teachers and aides are part time, right? Most of them are. You know, so you can get a four year degree for a part time job? I don't think so. 
it's it's you know what that's that's Massachusetts we're dealing with. They think they they think everything's stupid up here. They they do all kinds of stupid things up here. Um, but we won't go that route. Um, speaking of things, pe- the people think of st- are foolish. Let's talk about NASA and intelligent design. <laughs> all right. Um, I'm kind of torn on this story. All right, so we've got. Uh, oh, what's his name? David, David. Coppage. All right, yeah. he's the former team leader for NASA's Jet, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, the head of the Cassini mission exploring Saturn and its moons. And um, he is claiming that he was removed from NASA because of his belief in intelligent design. Um, not creationism, intelligent design. Uh, difference being intelligent design is, is, is much broader. It just says we believe that as you look out, um, as you look at, the universe as you look at at anything um that there are certain things that cannot be explained um through natural processes and that there is a uh that we see something um that they don't define um that uh, that we see in intelligence and and they just that that's all the further intelligent design goes now um there are within those who believe in intelligent design because it's a very broad category. You have old earth creationists, young earth creationists, theistic evolutionists, um, you know, and, and other people that are sort of, um, agnostic in a sense that, um, that just say, yeah, I just don't think that it could happen on its own. Um, and, uh, so, so he's claiming that the, the, the story is that on one hand that, um, that he was removed for budget reasons. Um, and then the, all this intelligence design stuff came out. Um, he was, uh, he, he claims that he was discriminated against because he engaged his coworkers in conversations about intelligence design and handed out DVDs on the idea while at work. Um, okay. So here's the thing I'm, that I'm struggling with. That, um, on the one hand, you should not be fired for your beliefs. On the other hand, just from what I'm reading here, and this is off of foxnews.com, so they're sort of, um, they're coming across as, as sympathetic to his case. All right. But just from what I'm reading here, it sounds like he may have been kind of pushy about it. Um, which, especially as the team lead, that makes it all the more um, tricky just because um, when you're in that position of authority over somebody, um, they are. it makes it difficult for them to sort of rebut anything that you're saying. He has gone unchallenged long enough. So, I don't know. I, I think that... Literally, the jury's still out on this one. Well, I mean, even if, um, um, even if he was a little pushy, you know, um, you know, is that, you know, a, you know, I mean, was, I mean, he said he got a warning for harassment. Uh, but again, um, <laughs> man, this stuff's so hard to figure out. I mean, what, in one person's eyes, might be now nah, he just talked about it. In another person's eyes, might be harassment. Mm-hmm. Right, you right. Know, um, and and you know, I've so, seen people removed from from jobs from for what I saw as they were just sort of even. I mean, somebody that I know of who's not a Christian, so it's not just Christians um, who just because of. Whatever it, it was, like his um, his his screensaver, or his desktop picture, or something like that, had a religious symbol that someone misinterpreted and and took as harassment. That, um, you know, and and he was removed, um, you know, without even given a chance to explain it or whatever. And, I mean, it, so what's harassment to one person is not to somebody else. 
So he certainly has the right to talk about what he believes. Right. Now, Eugene Volk uh, at the uh, University of California, a professor in First Amendment law, said the question is whether the plaintiff was fired simply because he was wasting people's time and bothering them in ways that should have let him be fired regardless of whether it's about religion or whether he was treated worse because of the religiosity of his beliefs. Mm. If he can show that he was treated worse because of the religiosity of his beliefs, he's got a good case. Right. Yeah, so it all comes down to that. I I think that it'll be really interesting to see because, I mean, if a person is wasting people's time and, and is obnoxious and making it uh, uh, the sort of work environment that um, – that makes it difficult for people to work there, um, and and he won't uh, listen to uh, reprimands and things from his superiors. Then, yeah, you know, you can be removed for that. Um, but if it's if it's a, more of a discrimination issue, uh, then that's not, that's something else entirely. So right. we'll have to watch this one and see how it goes. I, I think you can be a don't... Christian jerk, but still a jerk. You, you can be obnoxious talking about baseball. Mm-hmm. And harassing people about, you know, just baseball. But the issue is, is you know, was and, and and you know, but I'm sure, you know, the J, you know, JPL's got to have it well documented that you know there were a lot of complaints um, that he was overly pushy, and it wasn't about the religion. This would have been true of any other topic. And then they'd have to show examples where people are like, go for the same reason, mm-hmm. or if they can, um, or else they have to show that because um, it says that he was one of two Cassini technicians and among 246 JPL employees let go last year due to planned budget cuts. Um, But he says uh, those cuts took place months earlier. Uh, You can't lump them in after the fact. So um, I I, I believe the truth will win out on this one. Um, But I don't think that we have all the information to say what the truth is at this point. Yep, well, I think I think Volk's got it right. If he can make it, if he can prove his point, prove with his argument, he he can win. Mm-hmm. All right, ending up then, let's go to the presidential race here a little bit. Uh, um, and this is from uh, Yahoo News. Um, and well, I you know hear hear my First Amendment and another part of me get, come into conflict. Uh, if it kind of comes into conflict with the last story, it kind of comes into conflict in this one. Um, and that is that uh, um, uh, Rick Santorum uh, says um, that America is suffering from a pandemic of harm from pornography. Um, it's toxic. Pornography is toxic to marriage and relationships. It contributes to misogyny and violence against women. It contributes to prostitution and uh, sex trafficking. Um, and... Um, if elected president, I will appoint an attorney general, ger- attorney general, who will uh, enforce obscenity laws. Um, and he wants to basically ban all pornography. Mm-hmm. All right. So this is yeah, this is this is a struggle. Um, let's let's first talk about the obvious why pornography is bad. All right. If in case it needs to be said. All right. Pornography objectifies women and it, it treats them as toys and encourages people to treat them as toys um, and instead of as persons. Going back to an earlier article, uh, what defines a person and, and, and how do we treat them? Um, and, uh, and, but it, you think about the damage that it does to, uh, to relationships and, and marriages because uh, Pornography is, it's like, um, it's like it, it, well, um, if you've ever seen that, uh, cover girl, cover, Dove, uh, the Dove, uh, soap, um, they did this, this, uh, media campaign where they showed a model being made up, uh, where she sort of starts out at the beginning. I actually used this, um, clip as a sermon illustration once, um, that where she starts out with just being a, a fairly plain looking uh woman and um but then they they do this time lapse thing where they 
uh, clean her all up and, and do her hair and, and all this kind of stuff. And then after the, the ridiculous amount of, of makeup and, and things that are done to her, um, and they snap all kinds of pictures of her, then they start photoshopping her and actually start like moving her eyes on her head. And I mean, it's, it's pretty creepy, the stuff that they do. So by the time it's done and, and you see it on a billboard, it's, it's not her. It's like not even human because no human being has their eyes in that part of her head. Um, and, uh, and things like that. And, and, and that's just sort of standard magazine cover kind of stuff. And, um, and so what, what pornography does is it sort of takes that, um, to the next level. Um, because what you see in pornography is not real. Um, it's, you know, the, the same way that a, a Transformers movie isn't real, right? You know, there's, there's CGI involved. There's, uh, all kinds of crazy makeup things that are done in camera tricks and, um, and, and it's just, uh, you know, medication and everything else that's done, um, in order to, to make it look, uh, attractive, um, and, and so, and the problem is then people see that and, and they think that that's reality and they, they develop expectations that, oh, I want my wife to do that thing that I saw, um, in the pornography, or I want my wife to look like that person that I saw. Even that person doesn't look like that. Right. And, and, and the things that in the, you know, videos and things are not realistic. And, um, so it, it. It just it's And even if the person is real, they tend to be young. You know, you get burned out in that that business at age thirty. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's on to the next young thing. So I mean, you know, it's opposed to being, you know, married for thirty years. Yeah. I was telling my you know, this August we'll be married for thirty years. I was telling Janice the other night, I said, I remember when I turned thirty, I haven't been married that long. <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, I just, I, wow, this is something that I've also uh, said before as a quote from somewhere, and I can't remember where, but I agree with it. Um, you know, as much as we talk about gay marriage and things like that, right? The impact of gay marriage on um, on the American family is minimal compared to the impact of pornography. I mean, like you can't even compare the two. Right. Um, which I think we've mentioned before. Um, it's kind of interesting at the end of this, uh, there's, uh, uh, Rebecca Shankoff from, uh, Wonquette so has this quote. She says, uh, it seems Rick Santorum has found another time his busy schedule of condemning radical women for working outside the home and using birth control and nagging English speaking Puerto Ricans to speak English and is now turning his hot penetrating gaze to man folk business. B i z n e s s. See, we real we know this is a real professional um, uh, blog here because you know she can't spell. But anyway, um, the issue That's is, of course, that uh, pornography is not just male; it's growing among women tremendously, mm-hmm. generally due to the internet. Uh, now, the real question is, could um, you know, they, they, could the president uh, actually pass such laws? And, um, you know, Eugene Volk at the, at the First Amendment, uh, center out there at the University of California says, um, um, if the government wanted to aggressively move against internet pornography, it could do so. Aren't you wired online, surfing the web? It's tricky. Because defining pornography is difficult. Um, most definitions I've seen would outlaw the Bible. Well, I believe that a Supreme Court justice, and somebody, one of our listeners would can remember which one, it says, I can't define it, but I know it when I see it. Yeah. Right. And, and that's the thing. In order to make it law, you have to define it. Um, you have to we, come up with an objective definition. Right. Now, we are able to define child pornography. And so if we can define child pornography, um, which I, I, I can't tell you what the definition is, and I have no desire to look it up um, because the whole subject just really 
disgust me on a, a very deep level. Um, so, but yeah, if we can define that, I would think that there's somebody out there to come up with a working definition um, of pornography that, that could be used. Um, even if it's just to outlaw the, um, you know, not all of it, but a certain amount of it um, without eliminating art. And um, I've listened to uh, Ravi Zacharias, um, the Christian philosopher and evangelist, mm. that um, he's talked about it. And he said it, it comes down to um, its purpose. Is it um, is it done? Is is it is it created for the uh, purpose of um, of sort of artistic expression in, in the sense of I'm trying to I wish I had, I could remember the exact quote but um, you know is it done for for the purpose of 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 pointing out the beauty of the human body or is it for the purpose of titillation? And there's your definition. But even when you get into the question of purpose, that that works fine on a philosophical level. It doesn't work out so well in court because it's, it's uh, in a, on, in legislation because it's going to be really hard to define the purpose of something. Because then you get into yep. questions of intent, and and that is such a gray area. Um, so. Boy, I would I would love to see better regulation on it. Um, it's it's become so such a problem um, to the point that you know I get iPhones for my kids or any kind of a smartphone. I uh, just gotta work like crazy just to put filters on that so that because you know it, it used to be that you had to go into a convenience store or an adult, adult bookstore or something like that. Um, and request this stuff. But now it comes looking for you. Right. Um, well, Family Shield, uh, the open DNS, um, you can put that on your phone and that will take care of the um, your wireless in your house. Yeah, but it um, won't help with your, your uh, 3G connection. Um, right. here's, here's what I found. Uh, for uh, your PC and Mac and Android, uh, Symantec, uh, the makers of the Norton line of products, has a, it's called Norton Family, I think it's actually called Norton Family Shield. They use that same terminology. Um, and it is, a, it's really good. Um, they um, do not have uh, iPhone or iOS. Um, I, I like uh, Intego. Uh, content barrier myself. I find it very good for Mac. Okay, is that? I don't think they have a Windows. Okay, the Norton one's free. Ah. And and the nice thing about it is that you can. What you do is you set up profiles for everybody in your family. Yep. And um and you can say, um for this kid they're this age and it'll give you su uh, sort of suggestions of what to block and what not to block for that age level, and then you can customize it beyond that. Um, and it's very, I mean, it's like, do you want them to have access to sites that talk about abortion or not, religion or not, you know, and, and, and there's, it's pretty, there's a lot of, of options there. Um, you can also decide whether you want them to, um, have access to sites that they haven't yet categorized. And then you can set it to, do you want them to just, do you want it to block them completely? Do you want them to pop up a warning to them? Um, letting them know that this is, one to be the that's not recommended or something like that. And then the parents get an email saying that they tried to go to this site. And, um, so it's pretty cool. Um, I'm, I'm pretty impressed with it. And, um, now for, for if you have, uh, like an iPhone or iPad, iPod touch, um, it's not available for that, but there is a browser called the and and it has the iOS uh programs have pretty good uh parental controls but you except for the browser okay and for the browser there's a free 
browser called the um, the Ranger browser. Um, if you just look up Ranger in the App Store, you'll find it. And uh, and it has a, a content filtering, and it'll disable Safari. Um, so so you have that option there. Uh, that's that's the best that I've found, and those are all free. So um, there's also uh, the Triple X Church has a browser for iOS, um, but with that one, that's more geared toward adults or um, or at least older teens because it also has um, uh, links, bookmarks, and whatnot to um, information about uh, pornography and stuff, sort of message messages from the church itself um, about pornography and that, which, like, if your kid has a, if, if you have a, a, um, a small child or, a, you know, that's too young to really be talking to yet about pornography, um, you know, then you're not going to want to give them that one. You're better off with the Ranger one. There's another one that's, uh, it's for iOS that's, that's got a, a dog motif. I can't remember what it's called. That one doesn't allow bookmarking though. And, um, whereas the, the Ranger one is, is basically just like old Safari. So, um, except with the filtering built in. So you have to figure these things out when you're a dad with techie kids. <laughs> Yes, you do. Or, you, you know, uh, you could be some people, um, uh, just, just adults who struggle with pornography who need to know these things. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, absolutely. And what is it? it's like one in three adults, so. I think, is the statistic I've seen, um, is are, are using uh, pornography to a greater or lesser degree. I can't remember. The, I actually, it may actually be more than that. I can never remember the statistic, but it's, it's, it's really high. So I'm sure that just statistically that some of our listeners and viewers are struggling with this. All right. You know what? Um, do something about it. It's hurting you. It's damaging you. And it's not what God wants for you. He wants so much more for you. Is that the rest of that's uh, that's all of our stories, huh? That's everything. Well, I think we had enough tonight. I yeah, <laughs> running kind of long tonight. Sorry about that. Um, do you have any feedback this week? Um, Not that I can think of. No, <laughs> it helps that I haven't posted last week's episode yet. <laughs> yeah, well, hey, folks, Merry <laughs> Christmas. Anyway. <laughs> So, well, thanks for bearing with us, everybody. Thanks for uh, for checking in. And uh, as always, we welcome your feedback. You can email us at podcast at crossfeednews.com uh, or just leave a comment if you're watching this on one of the video sharing sites, and we'll get that. And um, as always, we, um, if, if you do post a comment, uh, just note that we don't tend to respond in the comment field for that video. Uh, what we do is we discuss it on the um, on the next episode. And so if you do leave a comment, uh, make sure that you watch our next episode to uh, to see our response. Yeah, you know, you'll see it next year. <laughs> so take care, everybody. We'll talk to you later. God bless. Yeah, good night, everybody. God bless.